pray. Father, we just come. And oh, Holy Spirit, how we thank you for your presence. How you brought our hearts and our minds attention unto the Father on the throne and your Son, his Son, Christ Jesus. Now, Holy Spirit, you've been so good to be with us this morning, so good to be with us in this service and this time of worship and experiencing your presence. Holy Spirit, will you please just stay here? Will you do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask and think in our midst today? Oh, glorious God. In this we pray, in this we believe, in this we expect. In Jesus' name, amen. So good to be here this morning. So glad to have you with us. Over the last couple of days, we've had a had a great time in this very facilities. You as a church, we invested in our, our local community. We invested in our church and invested in the safety of it. We believe that lives are worth saving. And, and over the last couple of days, it's been a time where we've brought law enforcement officers, where we've brought churches together, many different representatives uh, from different communities, different towns. It's been a, a, a fabulous time. It's been instructional. It's been encouraging. It's been, most of all, inspirational. The Spirit of God was in it from the start, was in it through the finished. And I don't know so how many times you, and we invite you to stuff. No, I'm not beating you up. I'm just telling you, we invite you all this stuff. That I don't think I want to do it. Can I just kind of whisper something? You missed it. <laughs> you missed it. It was really, really good, but it couldn't have happened without your financial giving, without us taking that and, and reaching out and loving our communities in the name of our Lord. But in the mix of that, we've got to meet some neat, wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ that have come to lead some of those seminars and, and, and bring that on. And, and one of them we just kept. I mean, we didn't know. We didn't want to send him back. We sent everybody else back, Jimmy, but we kept you. We just liked you that much. And uh, anyway, and I'd ask, Jimmy, if, could you just stay over and speak today? And so today it's going to be my pleasure to have from the wonderful state of Texas, uh, Jimmy Meeks coming. He's been a law officer for 35 years, retired from there, a minister for 42 years. But most of all, he'll be used by God today to speak to our hearts about our glorious Lord. Would you give him a cowboy church welcome? I mean, a good one. He's better than that, a little better than that. Woo! You bet. Woo! Now we're talking. Break him, feel welcome. Woo! Thank you, Pastor. Well, good morning, everyone. Is this thing working? Wow, well, great to be in the Cowboy Church. I'm from the great state of Texas. You know where that's at, don't you? That's the one on bottom that holds up the other 49. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'd like to do. Uh, I'm real confident that some of you have been waiting for a very long time for a certain thing to happen in your life. And I think today is going to be your day. But in all my travels, I've noticed some things, a couple of things. Number one, people in the world are very confused about what God is like. People in the church are twice as confused. There's so much talk about religion. We, talk, we hear about it every day because of uh, Islam and terrorism, and, and we hear about the, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism. Do you know the, the largest religion in the world, the one that has the most members, is Christianity? But the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. By 2050, there will be more Muslims in the world than Christians. Did you know that? That's a challenge to us. We have a lot of weird things going on. For instance, 80% of kids who presently go to church are going to quit right after they graduate high school. That's a national number across the country. Think about that. If you have, say, 200 kids in this church... And what is that? That's going to be about 160 of them that are going to quit when they graduate high school. There's something wrong in the Christian faith. There's something wrong. And I've noticed that people are very confused about what God is like, and Christian people are twice as confused. And I've noticed something else. There are a lot of broken-hearted people in the world. Have you noticed that? There's just a lot of people who are very wounded. They're very hurting. But I just noticed there's a lot of broken-hearted people, women who've been sexually molested. We have a, a rape in this country every three to five minutes. We have 98 children sexually molested every hour in this country. 2,300 kids will have been molested tonight before they go to bed. That's heartbreaking. They're going to grow up, and they're going to have a broken heart. 60% of girls will be sexually molested before they turn 18. 
And many women, it's difficult right now for a lot of people in the room to move and respond because you know stuff like that has happened to you. There are men in this room that have been carrying a broken heart for 50 years. You had a father who never touched you, who never hugged you, who never told you he loved you. Some of you in this room, many of you in this room, if you're anything like the rest of the country, you have been carrying a lot of pain in your heart for a very, very long time. People are very, very wounded. I remember one day when I was a police officer, I was sitting at the desk talking to this young lady. She had a broken nose and two black eyes. It was all bandaged up. She showed me the note her boyfriend gave her. I love you. I pray for you. I pray we can be reconciled. And he was the same boy that broke her nose and black, blackened both eyes. Fifty women are beat up or assaulted in this country every 60 minutes. A thousand women a day. All of this put together is making a nation full of broken hearts. Look at the anger. Look at all the people mad at President Trump. Protesting in the streets. Setting police cars on fire. Turning them over. Knocking out windshields of businesses or of cars and, and glass uh, windows of businesses. Look at all the hate and the anger. There is so much brokenness in this country, and I submit to you, a lot of it is also in the church. A lot of wounded people. I see it all the time. You can usually tell, even by the way somebody looks in their face. Isaiah 2 says their faces testify against them. Now, I want to share something with you, a story that you're very familiar with. I want to talk about the prodigal son. You know that story, Luke 15. You remember that Jesus told this story. He told three stories about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and, of course, the lost son. Remember when he told this story, the Bible says he was inside this house and sinners had gathered around him. Remember? They were uh, drunkards, tax collectors, prostitutes, television preachers, all kinds of weird people. <laughs> all kinds of weird people and sinful people and messed up people gathered in this room with Jesus and he told them stories. That's how he preached. And I love this because... Uh, what he's going to do is talk to these people about what God is like. And it's going to utterly stun them because you need to understand this. The people in Jesus' day could not believe that there was a God who was interested. Thank you, Stephen. But I've noticed all this brokenness, and here's Jesus talking to these broken people. Now, remember, he's laying around in this room, and he's talking to people who could not imagine or fathom the idea that the God of heaven has any concern about their lives because the religion of their day had taught them that they were wicked, defiled, and sinful, and God had no interest in their lives. So when the Lord Jesus, who is God in the flesh, is talking to this people, their jaws are dropping and their heart is stunned because they're blown away by the idea that there's this possibility, which is actually a reality, that this God does care and wants to have something to do with their lives. It's a wild thing. So he tells them a story. You know the story. He tells them the story of the prodigal son. There's this son whose daddy's got millions of dollars. He goes to his dad and said, can I have my share of the inheritance now? I want to go party. The father's broken hearted. Gives the son a million dollars, we'll say. And the son goes off and he lives his life satisfying every desire that his flesh has. Amen. He drinks. He does drugs. He sleeps with prostitutes. He does everything that his flesh wants to do. But then one day, he's got no money left. He's broke. He knows he's in trouble. He has to get a job feeding pigs. Now, I'm from Arkansas. We wouldn't have no problem with that, but... If you're a Jewish boy, the last thing you want to do is work with unclean animals. Amen. So here he is, a few weeks earlier, with a million bucks in his pocket, and now he's broke, he's starving, he feeds pigs, and he watches the pigs eat and thinks, wow, that sure does look good. And the Bible says one day, he came to his senses. And he had this wild thought. He said, I bet you I could go home to my father and get a job as a hired servant. Amen. Come on. So he does. 
He starts making his way home. And the Bible says the father saw him from afar. And the father responded, you recall. He ran out there. He kissed the boy. He hugged the boy. He turned to his servants and said, hey, we're going to have a party tonight. Kill the fatty calf. Bring out the ring. Put it on his finger. Put sandals on his feet and a robe on his back. And they partied their hearts away. And the elder son, as you recall, wouldn't even go to the party because he was active in church. And he didn't like the idea that the father was celebrating this son who had lived so evil and so wicked for the last two or three years or however long it had been because the son was religious. You see, the boy had a religious mentality. The son knew he's just in a mess. So from that story, I want to make two or three points. Number one, I want you to understand that when Jesus told this story and conveyed to these wicked people that God was their father, that was more than they could take. And when the people listening to Jesus heard him say, is he saying we can call him father? His father can be our father? When Jesus taught him to pray, he said, our father? In John 14, 15, and 16, 28 times Jesus called God Father. Over 200 times in the New Testament does the Bible refer to God as our Father. Romans 8 and the book of Galatians says the Holy Spirit lives in us and cries out through us, Father, Abba, Papa. God is not interested and giving you a job to do, a task to perform. He doesn't want servants. He wants sons and daughters because he's a father. Amen. The Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons. We have got to get the truth of God's fatherhood restored to the church. He's your papa, your father. I remember one time my daughter Rachel, she was about two years old. She was sitting on my knee, and I was bumping her up and down, and she was playing like she was riding a horsey. She had never spoke to that moment an intelligent word. I'm not sure she has since, but that's another sermon. <laughs> she had never spoken anything I could utter. She was just laughing and giggling, and all of a sudden, to my complete surprise, she said, Daddy. Dad, do you remember that? Amen. Remember that first time? Amen. Woo, boy! I stopped. I burst into tears. I shouted at my wife, hey, babe, did you hear that? She called me daddy. She said, I heard that. I got real quiet. I sit there for a moment, real quiet. I sit there for a moment, just kind of crying and thinking about it. And I heard God the Father speak to me. And he said, son, I feel that way when you call me father. Hallelujah. Your father. He's your father. He's not looking for you to become one of his employees. He has none. He wants a family. Psalm 68 says he takes the solitary and places him in a family. What breaks my heart to know there are 25 million kids in the United States that have no one to call father. It is important to know what it is to have God as father. Amen. Your father. Something else we learn in this story. This is a father who is very loving. When he sees the son coming, the Bible says, now listen carefully, you've got to get this. This will be hard for you to catch or for a lot of people because um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons it's so hard to receive this is because so many of us, and this is my problem too, so many of us have been injected with a dose of religion and we have not yet recovered. We're religious. Our life is about do's and don'ts, precepts and principles, thou shalt and thou shalt nots and rules and regulations. Most of us, or many of us, and I don't know hardly any of you in here, two or three of you, and I don't want to make any judgment, but most Christian people have been infected with a little bit of the Pharisee. But when the father saw the son come, and the Bible says he ran out there and fell on him and kissed him. Amen. Now listen to what this means. Amen. Because what it means in the original is this. When the father saw him, he ran out there, he knocked him to the ground, and they rolled in the dirt while the father kissed on him. 
And Jesus is trying to paint for you the picture of a God who wants to get it on with you. Amen. <laughs> I want to tell you something about God that's going to be even harder than that to receive. Listen carefully. Your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father is a ferocious, flaming, fiery, fierce, passionate, hot, wild, steaming, romantic, adventurous lover. He is, as Elvis might say, a hunk of hunk of burning love. <laughs> Think about this. Ferocious, flaming, fiery, fierce, passionate, hot, wild, romantic, adventurous lover. That's who he is. You know how I know that? I know that because he wanted me in his family so bad, but could not let me in because of my sins. He paid for them with the life and blood of his own son just to bring me in. Who in the world in the right mind does that for the wicked people? Let me ask you, do you, I, I, I don't want you to judge yourself and be hard on yourself and get into the feelings game, but is that not kind of mind-blowing to think? I guarantee you, I speak all the time, there are dozens in this room, your heart is broken to pieces, and the last thing you could ever receive is the truth that there's a God who's crazy about you. Have you ever thought this? It's a miracle that he loves us. Anybody ever thought that? Yes. Raise, your, raise your hand. Okay, well, I'm going to help every one of you get free. That's how many people in the room are deceived. Listen carefully. It is no miracle that he loves you. It would be a miracle if he did not love you because God is love. He cannot be what he's not. All these years you've been thinking God says, well, I see you there, Larry, and I'm going to try to love you. I'm working on it. That's what you have to do, right? You ever had to learn to love somebody? You ever say, I'm trying? That's you. That's not your father. God can love you as much as he loves you. Osama bin Laden. He's got no problem doing that because he is love. If he didn't love you with ease, he would have to act contrary to his nature. He is love. Never again allow yourself to think it's a miracle that he loves you because it would be if he did not, for he is love. And we know, we know that he loves us. And I know what some people always ask me this. How can you say he loves us? Jimmy, look at the world. You rattled off some of those statistics a while ago. A billion kids are starving. Look at the world. If God loves us, where's the proof? You're not looking in the right place. Beloved, we know God loves us because of the cross. <laughs> I know he loves me because of Jesus. Not because of the kind of car I drive or how much money I've got in the bank. I see people post on Facebook, oh, God is so good, he loves me. I got a new car today. That's got nothing to do with the love of God. You got that because you got good credit, you weren't thinking straight, and now you owe more money on a car than you know what to do with. <laughs> if God gave you the car, there'd be no payments every month. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with it if there is. I see people say, I got a new job, isn't God good? That's got nothing to do with the love of God. By the way, when you post things like that, what does that say to our brothers and sisters in the third world who are starving to death? What does that say to the 90,000, did you know this? 90,000 Christians murdered last year because they're Christians. How many of you knew we lost 90,000 people last year because they're Christians? Two of you? Three, is that all? What do you read? They murdered 90,000 members of your family last year for the second year in a row. Christianity was the most hated people's group in all the world. And you're praying about a new car? That's got nothing to do with the love of God. We know God loves us because of Jesus on the cross. Listen, the broken, battered, bloody, bruised body of Jesus is the high price of our redemption and the evidence of God's love. Jesus on the cross, that's how I know he loves me. Yes. It doesn't matter what I drive, how much money I got. I know people who've got nothing but love the Lord and are far richer than Bill Gates will ever be. 
That's how I know he loves me. The cross. Nobody can stand at the foot of the cross and look up and ask, does God love me? He loves me. Romans 5 verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave himself for our sins. For God so loved the world, he gave what? Possessions, cars, cash, and cottages? No, Christ. Here's the evidence that he loves us. When we look at the cross and see the bleeding Savior, we see him weeping for us, dying for us. That's how I know he loves me. Because of Jesus, it doesn't matter what you drive. No matter where you live or how much money, that's got nothing to do with your spirituality. You may walk with God and lose everything you got. All 12 apostles died a martyr's death. 90 million people have died for the faith since Stephen was murdered in Acts chapter 7. Walking with God is no evidence that he's going to bless your life with stuff. And you TV preachers need to quit telling people that. Stop it. Stop it. Making Christians feel guilty and bad because they don't have what you got. When you got what you got, because a lot of people ain't got enough sense to not give you as much money as they do. That's how that happens. We have Christ. If I didn't have nothing else to my name, I'd still be wealthy. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. I'm a wealthy man. It's got nothing to do with the clothes on my back. Or the money in my account or the car I drive, that's got nothing to do with anything. I got Jesus. <laughs> I got Jesus. Amen. I got Jesus. And that is the evidence of God's love. Amen. That's how we know he loves us. That's when he met us, tackled us, took us to the ground, looked at us and said, I'm going to kiss you all over. There's a crazy verse in Zephaniah. Everybody okay? Amen. Everybody all right? All right, good. You're better off than you realize, actually. There's a crazy, wild verse in Zephaniah 3. You ready for this one? The Lord your God in your midst is a victorious warrior. He will rejoice over you with singing and quiet you with his love. The word rejoice in Hebrew means to dance and twirl about. It is the picture of a God when he sees you saying, let me dance with you. This is too good to be true, isn't it? I know I grew up in church too. You've got to catch your stuff. Because I guarantee you, I bet if I were a betting man, dozens of you in this room have been carrying pain for years, and you've got more guilt than you can shake a stick at for things you did back before you even met your wife. Amen. Your father is dancing over you, rejoicing over you, twirling about over you. And then there's this crazy verse in Hosea. Listen to this. He tells the children of Israel, how can I ever give up on you? How can I surrender you to the enemy? Listen to what he says. My heart is turned over within me, and when I see you, my compassions are kindled like a fire. A father who looks at us and says, boy, I sure do love you. I was riding along in my police car one morning, and uh, I told you I was a cop for many years. And uh, because I've been saved most of my life and no one taught me better, I've always had these terrible guilt trips. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? Wait, wave at me. Yeah. About 10 of us. The rest of you can pray for us, all right? <laughs> you know, I've been hollering at my wife, hollering at my kids, and just feeling guilty. And when you feel guilt, you become even worse than you were before you committed the sin that made you feel guilty. You ever notice that? Yeah. I'm just driving along in my police car not doing nothing. I saw a couple of guys run by wearing a mask with a money bag. They just robbed. I just waved at them, you know. And <laughs> I came to this red light, and I stopped. And I said, God, here I am again on a guilt trip. I'm down again. I bet you get so tired of having to pick me up. And I dropped my head. I expected no response, but I got one. He said to me, son, it never bothers me to come to you and cheer you up. <laughs> I just started shouting and chased the robbers. 
<laughs> I was sitting at a stop sign one day, and I said, Father, how can you stand to even look at me? I'm so wicked. I put my head down again on my chest. You know what he said? Son, I see the finished product. The Father wants to talk to us. Now get ready for this verse because this is going to be hard to accept. In, in the book of Jeremiah, it says something really interesting. In Jeremiah, God makes a deal with his people. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll write you off and forget you and let you go if you can do the following two things. He makes a deal with them. He says, okay, I'll leave you alone. I'll get rid of you. I'll abandon you. But you have to do the following two things. What is it? Number one, you have to come to heaven and measure it. Number two, you have to dig to the center of the earth and explore it. Does anybody catch the irony? You can't go to heaven and measure it. You don't have that capability. You can't dig to the center of the earth and explore it. You don't have that capability. Why did God say that? Because he was saying this. There's no way you're going to shake me, boy. I'm going to stick with you through thick and thin, hell and high water. I don't care what you've done wrong. I don't care how you've sinned. I don't care about your past. I don't care whether you're black or white or Hispanic or Middle Eastern or anything else. It means nothing to me. You're mine. I bought you hook, line, and sinker, and you're never going to get rid of me. I'm in this thing with you for the rest of your existence. Nothing, Paul said, nothing, Romans 8, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. You may say, Jimmy, you don't know what I've done wrong. You don't know what I've done wrong. But God knows what you've done wrong. And he says, hey, let's move on. I love you. I know what you did wrong. But the Father says, I paid for that. Amen. And I'm stuck on you. And unless you can get up here and measure my house or go to the bottom of the earth and explore that part, I'm not ever going to let you go. I'm stuck on you. Y'all need to learn that Elvis song. You ever remember the Elvis song, Stuck on You? You can shake an apple from an apple tree. Shake it, shake it, sugar, but you'll never shake me. Amen. Sing that. Obviously, y'all will sing anything. Why not sing that? Hide in the kitchen, hide in the hall. Won't do you no good at all. Because once I catch you and the kissing starts, a team of wild horses couldn't tear us apart. <laughs> I miss Elvis, even though I know he's not really dead. <laughs> I saw it on a sign the other day outside of Arkansas. Elvis lives. See, there's proof. <laughs> he loves you so much. You know what else we learn from this story? The father forgives. He forgives. The son comes back, and the father puts a ring on his finger. Does anybody know what that ring was? That was a credit card. Really, that's how you, that was what a credit card was in those days. You had a little emblem, right, Pastor? I mean, Pastor, he'll, tell you, he'll, he'll explain this later, but take my word for now. When you went to buy something, you just... Stuck it in the clay or whatever kind of substance it was, and that was a promise to pay. Think about this. The son comes back. He's blown all million dollars, and the first thing the father does within 30 seconds is give him a MasterCard. Can you believe that? If, if that had been me and the son showed up, I would have said, hey, boy, I've been following you on Twitter. I know I gave you a million. I wrote it down. I keep a record of every good thing I do. You got any of that money left? I mean, surely you've got some left. But the father says nothing to him about the money he's blown. He puts a robe on him. You know what that robe could represent? Revelation calls it the robe of righteousness. You know, the scripture says all that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Did you know that you are as righteous as Jesus Christ? You are as righteous as Jesus. Jimmy, you don't know how I live. That's got nothing to do with it. Pastor will explain this later. Just hold on to this now. You see, the Bible says... You have put on Jesus. 
1 Corinthians says it like this. By God's doing, you have been put inside of Jesus who has become for you righteousness from God. I ask you, how righteous is Jesus is on a scale of 1 to 100? You're wearing Jesus. How righteous are you? 100%. You know why you're having a hard time receiving that? Because you're thinking of how you live. God sees you as his son or daughter. And the gift, Romans 5 calls it, the gift of righteousness. It's a gift. You weren't born that way. You were born sinful to the core in need of redemption. You cannot earn salvation. It is a free gift of God. But when he gave you new life, he gave you righteousness. And you're as righteous as Jesus. Not only that, are you ready for this? God, would you agree, loves Jesus the Son. How many of you could agree with that? How about this? God loves you as much as he does Jesus. Jesus said that in the Gospel of John. This is why our salvation is so great. This is why we ought to be the fastest growing religion, for lack of a better term, in the world. We got the best news. You've been given the righteousness of Christ. You've been given a new heart. Are you ready for this? He took out your old heart and gave you a new one. You have a new heart. Inside that new heart... It is bubbling over with joy and passionate desire to make a difference in the state of Missouri. It's a new heart with new desires and new cravings. It wants to bless. Everywhere it goes, it looks for somebody to bless. That's the way it is. It's a loving predator. I've never used that word before. That's pretty good. Get a patent on that. Your new heart that Christ gave you the father gave the son the robe of righteousness, robes on his feet, the ring on his finger. The father in the spirit has given you a new heart, and that new heart that's inside of you is filled with goodness. Romans 15, 13 says, Romans 15 says, Paul says, I'm convinced you are full of goodness. You've got a new heart, and it's burning with desire to make a difference in the world. It's what's called the new covenant. I was talking to a friend of mine one day. His name is Dave. He's 80 years old. I did not know that he was a heart transplant recipient. We talked every day. He never told me. One day I sat down with him, and he was in a real meditative mood. I said, what's going on, Dave? He said, well, I don't think I ever told you, Jimmy, but I'm a heart transplant recipient. I said, well, is everything okay? I said, no, you've never told me. He said, well, I, yesterday I met the parents of the girl who gave me the heart. He said, it, it was a 17-year-old girl killed in an automobile accident. He said, Jimmy, and he was being serious. He said, I, I have the heart of a teenage girl. And then he said, sometimes I get these urges to go to the mall. <laughs> you have a new heart in Christ. It's got Christ urges inside it. It looks for people to bless. It can't wait until offering time. It can't wait till praise time. It looks for somebody that's down and out and says, how can I bless them? What can I do? That's because of your new heart. You can't help it. You can't help it. It wants to bless. It wants to give. Because it loves people. I was cruising along one day, 15 minutes till 3. It was hot. It was 104 degrees. 15 to 3, 104 degrees, July in Texas. One of those easy days where you could win people to Christ. You could tell them, repent before you die or you'll go to Texas in July. <laughs> One of them days. I was trying to get off duty as fast as I could. All I could think about was a big cold glass of tea. Get off that vest, that uniform. I was ignoring everything to my left and right. I saw people committing all kinds of crimes, but I didn't look. Because it was time to go in. I took the exit. I'm almost there. I look to the right, and there's a woman standing by a broke down car. I said, Oh, I almost made it. <sighs> I pulled up beside her, not behind her. Now, when a police pull up beside you, that's the way of them saying, Unless you want to confess to the murder of Kennedy, I don't want to stick around here and talk to you. <laughs> if you got a dead body in the car, we'll talk. Otherwise, I want out. 
I stepped out with one foot, which was to confirm I am not the least bit interested in why you're on the side of the road. I looked at her. Ma'am, what's wrong? I have a flat tire. Oh. Oh. I sit back down the car a minute, so I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> and then I looked at her at again and said, wait a minute. She's married. I could tell. You can always tell when somebody's married. They look worn out, tired. <laughs> she had the married look. So I got out and said, ma'am, where's your husband? He's over in Dallas. Oh, that's 20 minutes away. Almost threw up on the spot. And then the father talked. Son, what? <laughs> you could change that tire. And I said, you could turn the thermostat down. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck. <sighs> wasn't like he was going to throw me into the netherworld. I was already there. <laughs> And then he said this. He knew how to appeal to that new heart. He said, son, you could change that tire for me. Woo. Remember, if you give a cup of cold water in his name, you get a reward. You change a tire in his name, you get a reward. How often do you get to change a tire for the son of the living God? Would that not be an honor? What if you took that approach to all of life? You bet. I'll be the best employee there. I will no longer work for my boss. I will work as unto the Lord. Ephesians 6, Colossians 4. So I said, okay. I took off my gun rig. I backed up the car. I got out. The spirit of joy. I kid you not. It fell on me and I started weeping like a baby. I took off the tire. I was sitting around back changing the tire, sobbing like a baby. I was so full of joy. She walked around. She saw me crying and said, are you okay, hon? Officer? I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> she walked away and said, never ask the police to change a tire for you. That's my new heart. You have a new heart in Christ. It's exploding with goodness. It can heal the sick, raise the dead, or change flat tires. So this son says to the father, listen to this. Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. And the father cuts him off and does not even address the issue of his sin. I'm not trying to make light of sin. The son confessed. But listen carefully. I have spoke all over this nation because of different things I get to do. And I have noticed something. God's people have a lot of guilt. Ever notice that? I would say seven to eight out of ten Christians I know walk around with a cloud of guilt over them. And that guilt crushes the heart. There are men in this room who've done some terrible things no one knows about. You were unfaithful many years ago. There are women in here who, who've been violated, who've been abused, who've been hurt. There's so much pain in every church. It's simply not something you could measure. And much of that pain is associated with the guilt of never having received forgiveness. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. In the old covenant, sin was covered. In the new covenant, sin is erased. You're clean. David said, blessed is the man whose sin is covered. With the blood of Jesus, we just sang about it. A.W. Tozer, you've heard of him, Brother Jim. He said, Christians don't tell lies, they sing them. What about that blood? Are you going to tell him, I know it cleanses me, but not from that thing I did back in 1984. Some of the women who've been hurt in this room, you have felt evil and wicked and dirty. That's the word I'm looking for. You have felt dirty since that day. And today, I think the Father wants to tackle you, take you down, bathe you, clean you, and stand you back up and say, you're my little girl, and you're clean as you can be. 
clean. And the good news, do you think that's why the Bible calls it the gospel and gospel means good news? To be clean? I mean, the enemy knows if he can keep us feeling guilty, we'll never get anywhere. And most Christian people go around feeling bad over what they've done, and it makes them sink deeper into the mud and mire. He wants you to know you're forgiven. You're forgiven. In him we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Forgiven and loved. A father that is almost too good to be true, yet praise his name, it is true. A ferocious lover. Wow. Years ago, <clears throat> years ago in Traverse City, Michigan, you know where that's at? The land of cherry trees, about 60 miles from Detroit. There was this little teenage girl, about 15 or 16, we'll call her Susie. She was always arguing with her parents. And one night she got into another argument with them and said, that's it. She waited till they went to sleep and she acted on something she had planned on for a long time. She packed her bags and ran away, even though she was only 15, 16 years old. She went to Detroit, to the cold, bitter streets of Detroit. No sooner had she got off the bus, within minutes, she met a man that took a liking to her. She called him boss before long. He was a pimp. He put her to work as a prostitute. Took her to an apartment, a beautiful, plush apartment, beautiful furniture, all the clothes that she could ever dream of having, and um, all the food she could want. I mean, her life was perfect. This is what her parents had been keeping from her, she thought. All she had to do was turn tricks as a prostitute. And since she was so young, men paid a high price to be with her. But as time went on, she contracted a disease. The boss came and told her, we can't be too careful. I can't use you anymore. Get out. He threw her out onto the street with just a few of her belongings, and she began to live, even though she was a young teenage girl, on the streets of Detroit. It can be so cold in Detroit. You know if you've ever been there. There were nights that she slept in alleys and used newspaper as a blanket. One day she was buying some food at the grocery store. In the dairy section, she was in the dairy section and she saw a milk carton and her picture was on the milk carton with a caption that said, have you seen this child? She went on about living her life and then one day she got this crazy idea. I wonder if I could go home. This is too much. She looks so old now and worn out, though she was still 16, 15 years old. She got up the courage to call her house. She gathered some money, some coins, went to the phone booth. Some of you kids don't remember what that is. There used to be phones in a booth. <laughs> you can make a call. She got in the phone booth, called her house back in Traverse City. The answering machine came on. She hung up. She thought about it for a few more minutes and then said, I'll try again because I want to go home. She called, the answering machine came back on, and she said, Mom and Dad, it's me, Susie. I was thinking about coming home, if that's okay. I'll understand if you don't want me. I really will. But either way, I will be in Traverse City tomorrow at 9 o'clock at the bus station if you want to come see me. If not, I'll just stay on the bus and keep going. Bye. She hung up. The next day, she got her bus ticket and made her way back toward Detroit. It's only about 60 miles, if I remember correctly. Not sure, give or take a few. But all the way over there, she practiced, what will I say? What speech can I give my parents? She practiced all of her speeches. At one point, she pulled out a compact mirror, and she looked in it and noticed how old she was, and her fingers were yellow from nicotine, from all the cigarettes that she'd been smoking now for so long. She put that back in her purse, looked outside, saw a sign. Traverse City, 16 miles. A few minutes later, she heard the hissing of the brakes on the bus. The bus driver came on the intercom and said, Ladies and gentlemen, this is Traverse City, Michigan. We'll be here 15 minutes. And then we're off. 15 minutes, she thought. She's practicing her speech in case they're there, not having any idea if they even got the message. She got off the bus. She walked in the bus, bus terminal. The doors opened, and of all 
the scenes that she had played out in her mind. This is the one she had not thought of. Forty members of her family and friends wearing goofy party hats, blowing goofy little party horns, shouting, Welcome home, Susie! She couldn't believe what she was sawing. Her brother, her sister, some cousins, aunts and uncles, even a great-grandmother. She looked up on the wall, and there was a terminal, excuse me, a big computer-generated banner that said, Welcome home! She was stunned. Wow. And then, coming out of the crowd was guess who? Daddy. He worked his way through the crowd, and he began to walk over to her. She got nervous. When he got real close to her, she began to give her rehearsed speech. Daddy, I'm so sorry. Hush, child. He put his hand over her mouth. Hush, child. This is no time for apologies. We have a party to get to. And they went to party. Your father celebrates you. You know what I'd like to do? I have the longest drive home today of anybody. All right, I'm driving all the way to Holy Land. Excuse me, Dallas. <laughs> Only pretty thing there is Cowboy Stadium, and it can be ugly when they play there. <laughs> Except for last year. You know what I'd like to do? Brother Jim, let's, let's pray for all the broken hearts again. Could we do that? What I'd like to ask is, I don't want you to tell anybody anything. I know it's kind of unusual. Do you give invitations or do you all just start singing songs you've made up or what do you do? <laughs> I'd like to pray for everybody with a broken heart. If you have a broken heart for any reason, you just need a touch. Could we pray for you? Stand up right now. Maybe you're a woman who's been violated. You've been hurting for years. I'm so sorry the way men have treated some of you ladies. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Some of you fathers, what you would give if before your father died, you would have heard him say, I sure do love you, son. I've got a police officer friend in Arkansas. His father died a few years ago. He tells me every time I visit him, I wish my daddy would have hugged me and said he was proud of me. But he never did. Some of you men have never received that touch. Everybody's standing. I don't have anything left, Pastor. I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm too parched. Thank you, God. Let's stay with him now. Let's stay focused on this and let's get some people prayed for. Scripture says that Paul prayed that we, the believers, would be rooted. We would be grounded in love. For God so loved you, for God so loved me that he came looking for us. Every part of our life, if we're going to live it, the, the foundation is the fact that we are loved. The greatest thing old Satan would like to do is to keep you from believing that God loves you. But this morning, the Holy Spirit has shouted it. He's let us laugh about it. He's let us look at it. He's let us hear it. And the greatest testimony is that cross Jesus. Believer or non-believer alike, today would you be willing to say, Heavenly Father, today I believe you love me no matter what. Amen. No matter what. Today some of you have never received that love, never entered into that relationship. Today all you've really got to say is, God, I accept your love. Today I want to become your child. And today, this day, for all eternity, you will become the child of God by faith receiving the gift of love that God has given you through Christ Jesus. So can I lead us to pray? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come to you now, and Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that you chose the term Father, and Lord, every good and every perfect and every right and every righteous and every holy thing that's related to that name Father, Lord, you are and you're so much more. 
And Father, first of all, I want to pray for some of those that are here today that have never received you, just because they never understood that you're the God of love, that you're the God of forgiveness, that you're the God of eternity, that you're the God that comes to live within them and live beside them and goes before them and goes behind them and keeps them and watches over them and provides for them. God, they've, they've never understood that, Lord, till today. And all of a sudden, it's finally making sense that you love them. You know everything they've done and everything they've not done, Lord, the good and the bad and the ugly. And, God, it was all forgiven on the cross of Calvary, never to be remembered no more, never to be mentioned anymore, oh, God. Oh, God, for those that have realized that today, help them simply to say, come into my life, Lord Jesus. If that's you, my friend, if that's you, say just simply say, come into my life, Lord Jesus. I accept your forgiveness of my sin and God become my father would you just say that come into my life I accept your forgiveness God I want you to be my father if you've said that simple prayer my friend God has answered it even now and for those of us that are already believers the spirit is calling us to believe that we are loved and nothing can separate us from this love. Nothing can abolish this love. Nothing can end this love. That never, ever can we do anything so bad, so often, so ugly that it's not covered, it's not forgiven, that it's not removed on the cross of Calvary. Would you just remind yourself of that? Yes, confess your sin, but knowing that confession, oh, you've got a Father that's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness for all eternity. Some of you have been a distance from your Father. Some of you have wandered away. Some of you have rebelled. Some of you have rejected. But today you're wanting to come home like the girl in Travers, Michigan. Today, why don't you just say, God, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Oh, Holy Spirit, you've begun a great work in our midst this morning. Now, Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you complete it. I know you're able. I know you're willing. And for those that just simply say, I'm coming home, would you just throw the party for them today? Would you sing from heaven today, Holy Spirit? Would you bring them the joy? Would you bring them the peace? Would you bring them the love? Would you bring them the forgiveness? Let them leave here dancing with the Father. Thank you for what you've done, God, and are yet to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can I class one more thing? Will you give the God that Jimmy preached about a round of applause as we leave? God bless you. God bless you. We're dismissed, my brothers. <laughs>